Despite the length and effort of this video, this is not an attempt at creating a magnum opus. Far from it, it is a cathartic mess designed to cap off my first year of YouTube while also indirectly and incompletely chronicling my experience with platforms, attention economies, and the desire to be recognized in my works. It is, largely, an effort of practical explanation mired in anecdote, to which I provide a smaller companion more expressly telling my YouTube story and sharing my feelings on the state of things. This will be a journey, from a made-up website to places monetizing creativity to a ridiculous cryptocurrency project into the past and a glance to the future. It is, despite this, still an essay with a thesis. The monetization of creativity through a means of nominally empowering creators will forever be intrinsically hostile to creativity so long as it is an incentive to produce. We'll be discussing the twofold path of monetization, one, the advertisers who are drawn in, and two, the payout for content creation and how creation becomes production. Some sites have one, some sites have both. Though it's rare to see payout without ads, we do have one example. The focus will, at first, largely be on that latter part, payout, demonstrated through a few models of how sites have implemented payout and the subsequent cultural ripple. Sites or apps changing their layout and design approach can massively impact culture, and we just kind of accept that. Think of Instagram and the change from being a place where people once posted wordless photos to how it's basically TikTok now. Generally, apps have expanded functionality, or indeed chased the market of other successful apps by adding features meant to turn their platform into an alternative. Again, Instagram and YouTube trying to be TikTok. But there's a lingering question of if people would even want to use Instagram or YouTube to do a TikTok if creators weren't directly incentivized to create there. For a bit on how those incentives work, there's a video by Swell Entertainment which I'll link below. Indeed, incentives will be a lingering theme of this video. Generally, the point is that things change, and one of the biggest sources of change is, inevitably, monetization and the culture it brings. How about we use a made-up example to chart the general trajectory of online content spaces? For fun, let's just make up a site. We'll call it Embler. Embler is a picture-hosting social media site. On Embler, people are able to post almost whatever they want provided it doesn't break laws. The site was originally intended as a place to post stunning vistas or cottage core home vibes. Sure, some users would post an image of some text, but it didn't change the vibe much and was usually just some live laugh love type junk. Eventually comments were enabled and a bit of conversation started in the comment sections, treating them like threads, sometimes irrespective of the actual pic. After update 1.7, called binding internally, the site featured text posts without the image element. Shortly after, this became the dominant way users interacted with the platform, going from an image posting board to sort of an err forum, and people took to it well enough. Eventually this change allowed for more interactivity between users and a degree of personality to come out from the formerly wordless space. With that, people started amassing followers around their personalities and commentary more than just how nice their DSLR photos looked. Sure, some people mourned the vibe change, but generally people liked having a place to post more of themselves, even if it is angry poetry. People are largely posting for the sake of sharing their feelings or communicating with friends, but some people have started to find reward in being recognized in an online space and really dive into the idea of growing follower bases. Now by this point, there have been ads on the site for a while, but it's nothing intrusive. Or no more intrusive than on other sites. Eventually, the site gets big and profitable enough that, to encourage growth on the platform and give back, Embler starts a program to pay their largest contributors. The change is subtle at first. People just post what they always did, and indeed they don't meet the threshold for pay anyway. But big accounts can now make it their job without having to worry about outside sponsors which were tolerated at most by the site administration. The fact that people can make it their jobs becomes aspirational, even. That said, not everyone on the platform jumps at the opportunity to earn, and the dichotomy of posters and lurkers is still there. There will always be lurkers. But eventually the tone of content shifts. People are now posting things with calls to action baked in. Advertisers have made it clear that a nebulous range of content is unwanted, even when it doesn't break site rules. An entire subculture once only full of aspirant 14-year-olds develops around the question of how to get big. Content is made with the express purpose of pretending to hold a definitive answer, the only true answer to that question. 
In the end, creativity becomes a job option. For some, it's incredibly lucrative. For others, supplemental advertising is part of their content. And for some, there's external platforms to help. These factors tether content to routine, and so begins the phenomena of monthly content waves. With the advent of Embler becoming a job comes a marked shift in quality of content, and with a shift in quality comes a shift in expectations. Casual amateurism becomes near derided. Some posters are even allowed to bend rules, so long as advertisers don't personally step in, or, as the case often becomes, get goaded into stepping in. It becomes clear that some people start flooding the site with content that, by just barely skirting the line of several rules but breaking none of them, are producing cash grab content, farming engagement, things like that. It starts to become a problem to the point of affecting the site ecosystem. The way the site filters content starts changing under the apparent idea of providing a better user experience, but to safeguard from bad actors, the mechanisms of the site are kept intentionally obtuse to such a degree that no one person, neither working on the site, working for the site, or posting on the site, could explain how it works. This goes smoothly until eventually some users start ironically worshipping the mechanism that filters posts. As with all ironic things on the internet, given a digital generation, i.e. the length of one full rotation of an American high school student body, about four years, the irony is lost on the new site members and they begin worshipping in earnest. This turns out to be the way to summon a dead god named Gargalon, or something, who proceeds to vanish as suddenly as he arrived, signaling the end of days. Wait. What was the metaphor again? Okay, let's go with a different approach. I'm just gonna go through some sites I have personal experience with and less focus on how they've transformed across years so much as how their current culture is informed by the monetization. Less before and after, more case studies. There's this site called Medium. It's basically YouTube for sapiosexuals. It's like, oh, I don't watch TV, I read for the internet. Like a blog. It's a blog. Okay, being less facetious, it's a platform founded by one of the co-founders of Twitter, Evan Williams, originally intended to be Longer Twitter. I suppose, at that time, the name was conceived to be a declaration of post length. The design has since pivoted to Williams' other area of expertise, blogging. It's now a place for blogs and air quotes, journalism, without having to make a website or understand WordPress. It's a hosting platform. By the nature of how blogs have been monetized for almost their whole existence, it's a little hard to say whether the monetization of Medium is an innovation or tradition, really. But there's a bit of what I'd call hybridization going on. The appeal, and how the site markets itself, is as a place where one can earn from sharing their thoughts. This is how it's structured. Medium has a whole host of categories and a tag system for designating how articles get sorted by genre. So far, nothing special. Now there are two types of articles, normal and premium, with premium denoting a paywall. If one pays for premium membership, they can get past this individually selected paywall as many times as they want. Without membership, you get to pass the wall five times a month. Three enmeshed things make medium interesting for our purposes. The ad-free nature, the way people pay in, and the way people get paid. But first things first, why does medium exist? The history isn't very long and I won't go in that deep. Essentially, Williams tried to make the first idea, and it didn't go super well because Twitter but more words just means a feed of Facebook rants. From there, the pivot was made to article-style posts, ostensibly reinventing the blog space, and then, proudly standing by that reinvention with an intended mission to save blogging from oncoming irrelevance. After that, monetization for creators in the form of the paywall came up in around 2017, pivoting the content to a sort of each man his own New York Times op-ed writer dog shit takes optional. What needs to be considered is that Medium exists to pay people. Let me put it this way. Writers existed before Medium. YouTubers didn't exist before YouTube. Yes, people made videos prior to YouTube, but first and foremost, the point of YouTube originally was ease of hosting, which led to a new type of platform. In part, Medium has that angle too. It is a platform for articles. No need to learn how to use WordPress or make your own website. Speaking of making your own website, nobody sponsors me. But I bet you thought of someone because you're on YouTube and I said making your own website. Kinda scary, isn't it? The new generation of corporate jingles being etched into your brain. 
Uh, I hope several people didn't just click away to try and find where the ad ends, because there isn't one. Medium's main value and primary goal is in being a place where writers can monetize their content. It is, in effect, democratizing not access to writing, but access to deploying a paywall. That paywall is the hybrid element, taking blogs and merging them with a tactic borrowed from traditional media outlets, themselves archaically positioned on the modern internet. With that in mind, let's talk about paying in and paying out. Hmm. Okay, well, the old link to how this payout works and the site premise is gone, and the new one just says, a portion of your membership will directly support the writers and thinkers you read the most, with no elaboration. From my memory, this is how it worked, at least at some point. For a monthly or upfront fee, users get to circumvent the paywall. A portion of the money collected from said fee is put into a creator fund, kind of like how shorts work on YouTube, if you're familiar. Then, the pay is portioned out each month according to not views, not visits, but how many likes, called kudos, an article gets from paying members. In effect, this means that the free-to-read visitors using up one of their five freebies cannot contribute to payout in any manner beyond the psychological. The way it was explained, again to my memory, was that paying members were essentially assigning a portion of their pay-in to an article for every kudos they gave it. It must be noted here that readers can give up to 50 kudos to a single article. There is no finite pool of kudos to give out in a month. They're not like casino chips with a static value. The worth of kudos is relative to the amount of them divvied out. This allows for some manner of granular satisfaction spending. In theory, if I have a membership and I give one article a single kudo and no other articles any, that article's writer will get my whole prize share. If I give one article 50 and another 50, they're both splitting it evenly. If I give 20 articles 50 kudos, the split is again even. My suspicion is that many medium subscribers are medium contributors. In one sense, this makes perfect sense. People who are on the platform will consume on platform. It's a generalized hobby space in the way YouTube is, but with a narrower reach. As such, the platform is inhabited proportionally by a larger host of consumers who are themselves creators. If my suspicion is right, it would go pretty far toward explaining the nature of content on the platform. A culture exists on the site of writing articles, of course behind the paywall, geared solely to be advice on how to make it on the platform. As we'll see later, this is not an uncommon dynamic. The more generalized content has its own similar vibe. In theory, the content of the site could have taken on any shape, but instead there's a looming productivity cult. It may be just my experience, subscribed as I was to the tags of writing and freelancing among the others that were non-work interests, but the majority of articles put in front of me were paywalled guides to success. Going on the site incognito, the suggestions are still productivity geared. Here's another question, when does one decide to put up the wall? When people have something important to say, there's arguments in either direction for if they ought paywall it. Shouldn't people earn for their time and effort? Say my story about an important issue everyone should know about goes viral. Shouldn't I get something for my trouble? And besides, the paywall has five free uses a month, it's not really blocking anyone from seeing my critical information. Right? There's a lot to be said, and indeed likely a lot of ink spilled, about the effect of digital journalism colliding with a need to keep the lights on, or profit. For an example of this, I merely cite the way some articles with information pertinent to things like elections or the global pandemic were paywalled by big journalism sites. But is that not fair? Was creating the article not labor? How else do we cover the cost of producing the article, of doing the research, of hosting the information? Well, as some of you might already be aware, that argument has some holes, biggest of which being that running a for-profit newspaper, or even running one at loss, is not always altruistic. Medium, at certain points, has paid famous people to post on their platform, behind the paywall, another tactic that will return. The core reason to be on Medium is that possible paywall, that angle of payout, and it's no more altruistic of Medium to create the opportunity than anything the gig economy promises. As far as the cultural impact goes, note that there is genuine content on Medium, but there's also the scars of incentivizing a particular culture, of clickbait headlines, of churning out content, of feigned empowerment. The paywall isn't a pay people what they're worth initiative, it's an earnings scheme.
But what if there was a much worse monetization scheme for writing articles? I mean, sure, it's a bit hard to imagine, but like, what if we combined two radically awful ideas, like say the unusable fandom wikis but for regular Wikipedia content and cryptocurrency web 3.0 decentralization fantasies? Well, we don't need to imagine, cause it was real and I was personally involved. I simply cannot begin to tell you how excited I am to have an excuse to share this story. Okay, so back in like 2017, I was working in a bar and a coworker of mine who was a relatively early adopter of cryptocurrency, he'd been at it for years and again this was 2017, told me about this new platform that was doing a writing contest with a cash payout. Kinda. The platform was planned to be, and explained to me as, decentralized Wikipedia, which we'll come back to shortly. The contest was to write the first wiki articles for the platform, and the top three articles got a prize, paid in Ethereum, a then mid-sized competitor to Bitcoin, but not as entrenched in the crypto space as it is now. For the curious, this isn't about to become a cryptocurrency rant, though I probably do have one in me. It is, however, important to understand the culture this site was designed in and around. I'm not going to go too deep into that here, and while I would suggest Dan Olson's line goes up to get a sense of it all, the video is hours long and you'd forget to come back here. Also, chances are you've already seen it. My friend was very in on the idea of the platform, called Lunar, and planned to buy the token, which, mind you, is like buying stock in a company, particularly an initial public offering. Not like buying a digital currency in this case. He fully believed in this company and their plan. I was skeptical. But I mean, maybe there was something to it, so I sent something in and was part of the community for a little while. So what was the plan? Well, the short version is, as I said, a decentralized Wikipedia. But Wikipedia, famously, doesn't make money unless it's doing that fun little guilt trip donation drive at the top. Lunar wanted to have ads. In fact, that was the selling point, because Lunar itself and investors weren't the only ones poised to make money. They wanted to offer an aggressive meritocratic earning opportunity with the platform. Articles would get ad revenue for clicks, and I know I've implied this already or outright said it, but these articles are meant to be Wikipedia-style articles, not recipe blogs or news articles or whatever. But the idea is also to write an article that rakes in views. Hmm. So the goal becomes writing the best article, winning the marketplace of ideas, and getting the most views. There's a lot wrong with how this model shakes out, and I'm sure some of it feels immediately apparent. For one, topics. Writing the article on some obscure Irish poet from the 18th century might be a non-competitive space, but it's also not likely to get many clicks. The incentive to write about things that aren't already common knowledge isn't really there. And as for making sure articles are written well and not just made up unsourced nonsense, well, we'll get more to that later, but for now just know that there were intended to be self-deputized subject experts who vetted things. The incentive to write these things at all is dependent on pay. That's the short version. The monetary incentive made this immediately an untenable train wreck. And people, uh, didn't seem to get what the whole site was even meant to be? This really is at least half tangential, but it's too funny not to mention. Wiki-style articles. That's the intent. Yeah. Easy to understand, even if the decentralized lingo flies over your head. Even if the connection to the blockchain stuff makes no sense, the Wikipedia part should still click. The submissions they got, however, and I know this from seeing what articles came up on day one, were more like bad medium posts. One I saw and distinctly remember was, why do women date jerks, which, after review, was requested to be reformatted to sound more like an academic article and renamed itself to The Jerk Boy Theory. Continuing that trend, lots of the content on the site was what you might expect from the culture of the crypto community even as far back as 2017. So while that one article was basically a retooled rant about how women only date assholes, it was hardly alone. There was another filled with pickup artist dating tips, and another one I saw was about female sexual hypergamy. Almost all the articles I saw there were either slightly veiled red pill interests or literally about the crypto community itself, like articles about Ethereum or coins or whatever. 
This is no longer tangential because it played a hefty part in the site's downfall as well. The site wanted to replace Wikipedia, and terrible business model aside, it presumed it could farm out all the content generation to users and that somehow this would produce a rounded and totalizing pool of information. Based on the incentives, on paper, they thought users would rush to stake writing the Winston Churchill article and that presumably once the big known topics were covered, people would go for more obscure ones, trying to claim more and more real estate, so to speak. My clever idea in all this was that it would be very smart to twist articles one writes to always have an undue amount of hyperlinks to other articles you made. So say you wrote the article on World War I, a huge topic. Not only would this be a popular search, but it would also provide branches to tons of other topics. So what if you just also happened to corner all those topics too, rushing in to fill every possible hyperlink with an article that you made? That's going to shape content, and moderation was unlikely to target an article for including superfluous hyperlinks because, well, let's talk about moderation. Moderation was also expected to be farmed out, or more accurately, it was meant to be self-evident, done by the community and in the community's own interests to moderate. Like some kind of hyper-individualist community effort? I don't know. In truth, the whole thing feels like a case study in how ANCAP communities cannot function. In terms of moderating for quality, there was only one approach, and it had a simply massive blind spot. The quality of articles would be self-correcting, because the best articles would win in the marketplace of ideas and get the clicks they deserve. Okay, actually there's like four blind spots there. Let's run through that one again. The quality of articles would be self-correcting, because the best articles would win in the marketplace of ideas and get the clicks they deserve. Okay, uh, problem one. I'm not on Wikipedia sorting articles by number of citations or how compelling the writing is, I'm there trying to learn what the fuck this band everyone keeps mentioning is all about. Two is that they hoped to incentivize touching up bad articles by splitting revenue from an article based on edits. Now, fundamental to this on some level is the blockchain element of it, or allegedly that was part of it. Because in theory, there weren't supposed to be edits. Stuff was etched in stone, but in practice, they actually did do edits to pages. I guess their idea was that users would write wholly distinct, new, better versions of other articles and replace the old one, acting as market competition, but for info on what clouds are. But that was highly impractical, so it just opened up to editing like we saw with the Jerkboy Theory one. Sure, the old versions were somewhere on the blockchain, but that seemed to solve a non-problem. Wikipedia doesn't have famous instances of whole articles vanishing to censorship. Solving this non-problem just invented another one. Open Season was declared on articles for producing needless edits and then having someone calculate shares of an article's ownership. If I write the Winston Churchill article and it looks like this, and someone comes by and adds to it making it look like this, do I still get a share? Keen-eyed viewers might notice that I've literally copy-pasted Wikipedia here and no, that wasn't just to avoid writing a whole fake Winston Churchill article, it's because this was another literal problem of the site. Three, people were copy-pasting things from Wikipedia. The site's runners said they didn't like this very much because they had to pretend to be better than Wikipedia, so obviously they would curate only the most smart boy, powerful, intellectual, and thorough user base. This meant that, far less than the charge of plagiarism, the concern was that Lunar's information ought to be different somehow. I mean, that's in the conceit. Decentralized Wikipedia didn't just mean, like, wiki on the blockchain. If anything, the blockchain obsessions and the practical site functions were wholly divorced. It meant something to the effect of Wikipedia without meddling from insert bad thing. I'd call this Wikipedia for paranoid libertarians, but Jimmy Wales, the founder of Wikipedia, is already a self-professed libertarian, so I don't think there was some fear of his secret totalizing control or political bias as a motivator for founding Lunar as a competitor. Now, sidestepping the myriad of problems that presents in terms of authorial intent and historical accuracy and biases and all that, it's still a fundamentally absurd issue to have. They presumed their user base would act in good faith, which you should never do on the internet. They presumed that users would prioritize the viability of the site and incredibly long-term vision, a deeply long-term investment, instead of embracing the core tenant of crypto, fast money. 
The site runners were so blind to this reality of their user base that they were genuinely mad that the quality of articles was as shamelessly low as it was. Eventually, once the Wikipedia copy-paste issue was handled by being made against the rules, people started just doing that with articles not in English because literally no one on the skeleton crew staff of three dudes living in LA knew another language. All of this may have you wondering, okay, but what were the actual mechanisms of content review? What does leaving it to the people slash market mean? The way things passed inspection was that someone just looked at it, verified it, and got a cut of the future proceeds of an article for being its quality reviewer. Now, uh, the level of faith in the community on display here makes the communism only works in an ideal world thing, right-wingers say, look like the utmost projection. The creators of the site left moderation to the community with a monetary incentive for sheer volume of articles okayed, somehow presuming that people would take the task seriously instead of, at best, clearing articles for the sake of getting in on an easy revenue stream, or at worst, and most easily manipulable, forming off-site groups that would circularly approve each other's stuff no matter how dog shit it is. And so we circle back to language. 4. Translation. Translations were supposed to also structure their payout as a pyramid scheme. The French article on the decline of a woman's value as she got older would have to pay a share of its earnings back to the original English one. In turn, of course, this led to people taking the actual articles that were up and trying to stake foreign language versions by running them through Google Translate. Who cares if it's bad? People won't know that before they click on it, and it's not like entertaining content where people share it around if it's good. Cumulatively, we end up in a situation where there's not really recourse to fix that or do quality control. Say I technically wrote the first article on Alex Jones in Tagalog by copy-paste translating it. If someone goes in to fix my article, I still get a share of whatever their work amounts to in perpetuity. This disincentivizes people from ever improving an article until there is literally nothing left to stake claims on. This competitive collaboration was untenable from the start. The monetization scheme was untenable from the start. All that aside, the worst hole in the business model is the premise itself. Why would I go to an incomplete website to seek my information under the promise that this information is decentralized? somehow presuming that, one, Wikipedia is centralized, which I guess is code for secretly run by Hillary Clinton or something, and two, that a platform with literal monetary incentives would produce more objective, high-quality articles than a volunteer system. The concept was that it was free from censorship, but when pressed, nobody could name an actual censorious thing about Wikipedia, and given that the articles that came out on launch were just like bad incel talking points, I can only imagine what censorship meant to that community. The whole thing was like watching someone say, let the free market decide, without getting that that's just an empty platitude, as the market crowdfunds an initiative to have Mr. Market Decider himself lowered into a vat of acid. In the end, it was a terrible product with foolish goals, and a contributor base who cared more about monetizing an idea than seeing that idea flourish. And yet it had enough of an earnest streak that I can't exactly call it a grift. That said, it also wasn't free of the crypto cult culture of systematic aggression toward anyone pointing out a flaw. A fear of fear poisoned people's minds. The term fudding, meaning fear, uncertainty, doubt, was thrown around at any instance of a perceived critique. Naturally, this abject W for free speech enjoyers was not conducive to getting problems noticed or fixed. It's like the toxic positivity of a video game hype train, but worse because people think it's going to make them the next American billionaire. I think I said something in the Discord one time about how there was a bug, and I got added by like six people over it. By the time I had remembered the site even existed and further cashed out what I had left of whatever paltry amount of their token I got, they had around 3,000 articles up, and the vast, vast majority of them suffered from these aforementioned problems. The company, which may I remind you was literally three guys in an office, went dark in 2017-2018, though I wouldn't say it was a rug pull. Lunar's failure derived from incompetence, not intent. In the end, it's not exactly concrete proof of where monetization leads, nor is it free from the cultivated culture of duplicity, haste, immediate gratification, and outright grifting common to crypto land. It does, however, still provide us with an understanding of how incentives have to meet with the user base intent, and without sufficient control over users in other ways, the whole thing collapses. Further, it's a strong example of how these platforms are reliant on incentivizing communities to exist and create for them. 
They needed the contest not to drum up interest or as a marketing ploy, but to literally get their site populated with articles. I mean, what were all the losers gonna do? Not post their thing right after and try and still score some cash? Can we learn anything from the way the site functioned? The intrinsic model of a crypto climate warps it a fair bit to being more about early adoption and revolutionary promises. So much is predicated on getting in at the ground floor that the business model itself is hardly applicable to other sites. That said, the climate of crypto is a window into the logical endpoint of a hyper-monetized internet. Crypto itself exists with the promise of monetizing everything. That's why there's projects seeking to, like, turn MMO grinds into earning potential. NFTs, by design, are not only an art theft scam, but also remarkably driven by the idea that one can monetize memes, something we all take as, famously, having no ownership. To return to a narrower insight, Lunar is a case study of how their incentive structures for generating content, or more correctly, prompting user-generated content, seeing as they didn't make anything themselves, made the collapse inevitable, irrespective of the broader crypto ecosystem. From this, we're set to look at incentives more narrowly, and we're going to do that on a site that literally all of you are acquainted with. With YouTube, a journey of sorts began for me. And while I'm sure it's got as much of a passing similarity to the journey of others as it does moments of disconnect, it is my window into another intersection of monetization and a platform. One I had far less of a view into when I simply consumed on the platform. Even when I found spaces of creators, it felt more like I was walking past communities or through their places of congregation on a journey alone rather than walking with them. I had to walk that lonesome valley by myself. Early on, I compiled a list of videos from various creators, seeking to explain the process a bit. From Thought Slime's two or so tutorials on what to consider when doing YouTube, to the odd Q&As of many creators where people had asked things about the process, and to things less intended for that purpose of getting people into creation, like Big Joel's videos on small creators. Something that gave me direction, intended or not, on where to go next. From there, I gravitated to these small YouTuber spaces, particularly the discords. I'm alright at being present in online community spaces, so being in discords wasn't particularly strange to me. What was strange was the way it kind of reminded me of Lunar. Not in that it was a grift or whatever, and not that everyone there was just hoping to make a quick buck, but they were all there to make something. They wanted to make it. And that came with its own culture, one I wouldn't say translates fully to YouTube the platform, but it presents pretty plainly many concerns the platform plagues its creators with. Brushing aside the army of 14-year-old hopefuls who join to take no critique themselves while loudly saying the system is broken because their two-episode Minecraft Let's Play isn't uploaded for 19 minutes and hasn't cleared a million views, most people were there to put in the work in some form. I don't think the space ever got competitive or included bad faith advice as some form of sabotage. It was uplifting, but it's uplifting in a nobody wants to be here kind of way. Less crab bucket and more waiting to get adopted. If adoption required like ample life hacks and eye catching cool hair or something, the metaphor is escaping me. What I saw there was largely people trying to workshop things, figure out not just their craft, but the algorithm. When I later graduated to the partnered YouTube Discord, it felt like all the hustle elements of the culture were cranked up to 11. Now there's nothing wrong with playing the game, so to speak. It's impressive that people are even collaborating and sharing how to make it on some level. Honestly, I kind of get why people fall for Sigma male grind set stuff. Given the way that YouTubers are basically all entrepreneurs, you'd think that this stuff would be super popular here. In terms of how one runs a YouTube, you have to put in tons of hours before it becomes worth your time financially. It's very aspirational. But it isn't how I hear most anyone in at least the parts of YouTube I'm on talk about their channel. It's something more reserved for the people who are, I imagine, yearning to be stars, thus the yearning discords. There's a few reasons for why, even with a left tube that's very concerned with visibility and subsistence, few people fall into the grind brain, one of which is gigantic. Among the smaller reasons is creativity and expression. Ugh, imagine that. Creativity is reduced to being a small impediment to hustle rather than a counterpoint. So grand is the large hurdle. The creativity thing is really easy to explain. People make things because they want to make them. 
That's always going to be contrary to monetary incentive, even when they overlap. Passion pervaded even in those YouTuber spaces, even when people were also talking about branding or falling into pits of gamification. While I was in the YouTube discords, I almost felt like all the advice didn't apply to me. At the time, I debated if I was being stubborn about my style, and sometimes I was, which is why I can see growth. In retrospect, that makes me wince. That I didn't, for example, notice my audio was bad? There's something of an understanding about politics among residents of the District of Columbia. It's not, don't talk about them in polite company, as it may be in other places in the country, so much as, don't bother. But when I look back at the space, I feel like it genuinely was ill-fitting advice for the side of YouTube I wanted to end up on. Advice on how the first 50 videos are gonna suck doesn't really work for channels at my pace. Advice about uploading every four days at the exact same time doesn't suit longer form content. People still had outlets for creativity, sure, but the grind took precedence. The goals were always reaching numbers, not people. As a brief aside, I don't mean to sound dismissive necessarily. Maybe there's some stuff in there we could all do to learn. Sometimes I worry we might over-presume our own suppression and just stop trying to play the game even a little. Sometimes I worry there are ways we are out of touch, and perhaps I should only speak for myself here, but sometimes I worry that we value integrity more than the platform allows and aren't pragmatic with our concessions in order to reach goals. But this video can't be all worry. Another thing those YouTuber spaces operated on, besides grind and an individualist community was some measure of mysticism. These spaces act as, whether they know it or not, cults of appeasement, and their gospel transcends them to the whole of the site. The algorithm is a capricious god to be flattered, guides are made, remade, rituals discussed, debates formed around the nature of the machine. Less passion has gone into divining the cosmological significance of saints than that of the algorithm's nature. The algorithm is kept obtuse by YouTube as a matter of practice. It is in their interest to avoid the very gaming most people implicitly seek. And in that logic, that which strives to answer the algorithm, a transformation occurs whereby opinions and taste become best practice, and a language of content creation forms that is unintelligible to the viewers of said content. Said language is expressed in objective quality notes for thumbnails. Yes, thumbnails can be bad or lack readability, but there's nothing inherent in the human condition to the mimetic prevalence of soy-facing or whatever the hell people call the gaping mouth feign surprise thing. Yes, arrows are something we're trained to look at and then follow with our eyes, but I don't actually know that it makes a video twice as enticing to see them. When Hideo Kojima predicted memes, or whatever dorks attribute to him as the point of Gene meme scene and Metal Gear Solid 2, he didn't mean Wojaks or cat pics, he meant the way information is conveyed. The memetic conditions, stuff like the language of thumbnails. It's a product of platform culture, regardless of if it works or is mocked, or both. Clickbait is allegedly discouraged by YouTube's own rules, but said rules aren't using the colloquial definition of kind of cringy predictable curiosity fishing. They want you to do that. No, there's a slight shift in how they define rule-breaking clickbait toward being outright deceptive, something where the content inside doesn't match up. But how is that determined exactly? If Matthew Pathew doesn't make a shocked face in his A-reel pogging it out big mood, is it clickbait? What about titty thumbnails? I don't think there's any more quantitative evidence that titty thumbnails lead to people clicking off from a video midway than your average thumbnail. I don't imagine people feel betrayed that there wasn't bouncy bazonga content in a video titled This Guy Sold the Brooklyn Bridge Twice. Bait might just work. But I would be skeptical of anyone who claims to know for certain that they could prove it. A lack of access to algorithmic knowledge is supplanted with what is essentially folk practice backed up with loose science. We don't know the line between superstition and feature. An example you might see on Twitter is posting the link to a video in the replies, not the original tweet, because something something links are suppressed. These folk practices are sometimes localized to one community, and sometimes the product of self-deputized experts whose claim to expertise is a subscriber count. A while ago, noted Elon Musk reply guy Mr. Beast gave the advice of making 100 videos before being a success. 
Beyond being a comical example of falling for a survivorship bias paradigm to ask the big YouTuber how to get big when the real answer is, who knows? There's something very funny to how his imprecise wording led to some guy, or probably a middle schooler really, in the YouTube Discord creating 100 videos in an attempt to follow that advice. The kicker here is that many of the people a step down in the qualified to give advice sphere are falling for that same bias. Where Mr. Beast himself is just presuming he skilled his way to the top, the people looking to him as a case study have a different blindness. The beast observers, as I'll call them, look at large channels, huge ones, and analyze relative success compared to each other as though that data is unquestionably transferable. This thumbnail with the pog face got a million more views than that video doing, uh, uh, the home alone face, so better keep pogging. This title doesn't have nouns, and it did better so we can see that nouns are out. These methods of analysis are woefully incurious, focusing on current success patterns rather than the rise to that level. They make economists look like what economists think they are. These analyses from looking at huge channels to understand success presume and ignore too much to be objective. They presume an objective path at all. First and foremost on my list of massive blind spots is the unquestioned assumption in this analysis that from subscriber 1 to subscriber 1 million, the journey has the same rules barring an exception we'll get to. In presenting the data, how they often do, there's a presumption that Mr. Beast is earning the attention of 111 million views from scratch each time, that any and everyone could be enticed by the ultimate juicy thumbnail. There is, at once, an urge to understand YouTube as a predictable machine, despite YouTube having a vested interest in that not being the case, and an urge to pretend everyone can make it with the right tactics. And while not as stark a zero-sum game as crypto, that cannot be true. Not only because creativity and ideas will always retain a portion of value, but also because time, even shared across 2.1 billion people, is finite. The attention economy is very real. And that's saying nothing about taste or preference or language. It's like pyramid scheme exponential growth presumptions all over again. There is no way to entice the whole of the platform. Not every single person is a potential subscriber. Now that's not to disparage the actual success of these deputies. Some of their efforts may have been naive, but their results were very real. Subscriber count in at least the tens of thousands. But the individual practices and beliefs were not what caught my attention the most in the end. The striking part, the thing that formed the Lonesome Valley, for me, was that these were communities built around wanting to exit said community. It was a space designed where everyone in it wanted to leave as soon as they could, seeking self-reliance and independence, to have their own communities later. It's another communal space with individualist aims. Sure, people could network, but I don't know how much of that actually happened. One channel I discovered from the starter space is Shay's Violin, who I'm shoehorning in here with the hope some of you will check out her channel. Supporting others community is something YouTube does the least to encourage. It's something we fail to encourage half the time, even though it's important and effective. That's, I suspect, an implicit element of collaboration in the space, that people collaborate in order to have an excuse to share each other. I don't know if that marks me as paranoid or if I'm right, but I really do get the sense that there's some part of it all that's about having an excuse to mention another creator not as payment for the service of working together, but to work together as a justification for citation, for name dropping, for vouching. Building each other up is the main tool we have to weaken the hold the algorithm has. In fact, there's also a small collective trying to kill God right now called F the Algorithm. Now you may ask yourself if it's relevant that I may have been featured on FTA as their monthly nepotism pick once. Well... Really, and I do mean this, the reason I bring them up is to point at how there is concrete organization to circumvent the algorithm through community support, rather than bow to it and be subsumed by its vagaries or sliding back into a forced sense of individualism, back into the Lonesome Valley. The reason I bring up these YouTuber spaces and their counterpoint in F the Algorithm, despite not being platforms themselves, is that they demonstrate how YouTube's monetization culture ripples out how it affects people even at the most entry of levels, creates languages of creativity, or more so, production. The creativity itself is a casualty of trying to be picked up. Uniformity begets best practice. Best practice begets uniformity. So unto us all. In the language of YouTube, an objectively good thumbnail can exist. 
objectively good practices exist. Hell, while making this video, I legitimately debated excising the entire lunar section so I could market it as its own standalone video, one that could more easily be attached to discussions of crypto cringe, more easily offered as some manner of companion piece, so line goes up. Alternative to making it a punchy standalone bit, I would feel disingenuous making it the center feature of the title or thumbnail for this video. In turn, people won't know to come to this video for a juicy crypto L. I've had to, in that, consider the integrity of making an exploration of monetization culture in one succinct video, or tearing out a chunk to use as bait on its own. That itself is the impact of monetization culture. In that same vein, I debated the near hyperbolic positions of finding it either supremely tasteless or entirely to my point to mention Patreon in this video. While I recognize having an algorithm and monetization culture itself are nominally distinct and that all sites have algorithms, despite what some people think, we don't see the same fretting over algorithmic impact on other sites unless there's a flare-up in consciousness about the presence of an algorithmic bias, like Facebook or TikTok boosting fringe ideologies. There's a reason YouTube and the algorithm is a truly endless discussion, rivaling theology. I'm so fucking stressed out from running my pet lizard's Instagram account. I'm about to have a nervous breakdown. I told my therapist, she said, we'll take a break from your pet lizard's Instagram account. I said, I can't. It's my sole source of income. When I started doing YouTube a year ago, I didn't really have a sense of how to compare my experience to others, to get my bearings on when I was doing something right or wrong, to find feedback. I craved it, particularly because I knew on some level platform success was not correlated to quality. There was an algorithm in the way of meritocracy. Nevertheless, I still held and indeed may never relinquish that sense of a looming question of merit. At the end of the day, I don't know how anyone who makes content on a platform like this could even believe in meritocracy. I'm not exactly pulling from a huge sample size, mind you, but just from my own work since I've started, it's been incredibly obvious that YouTube has complete control over my success on the platform. You may say that's hyperbolic, and maybe it is, but here's my perspective on the matter. In a space where total appeal, that is, appeal to every single potential viewer, is not my goal, all I can do as a creator is try to present myself in ways that either I find appealing or I assume will appeal to an audience. Those aren't entirely the same thing, and there's a question raised about displaying one's own taste and personality versus appealing to people and being a character, but that's a huge branching topic all its own. Mirroring that is another branch into what living under an algorithm is even like, and how a subculture of snake oil seminars has formed in that ecosystem, but I'll leave that exploration to Super Eyepatch Wolf's video linked below. There's little I could add to that conversation beyond the glimpse at the creator discords I already gave. For now I want to center on a different element, the reason for the algorithm. Audience. The audience we're appealing to is and isn't people. Of course, YouTube's algorithm, from what we know, really only cares about marketability and watch time. It promotes people who keep people on platform for as long as possible, in range of their ads for as long as possible. But there's something of a tension there. Quality is measured by quantity. It's a framework of let the free market of the attention economy decide, rather than the marketplace of ideas. There's a lot of implicit assumption about the value of a video in the valuing of watch time. While it would be easy, nay, expected for me to say this is all bad, this is ultimately the quirk that has led to the relative success of the video essay genre in a world of ticks and talks. And credit where it's due, the reason I keep to this medium, both in terms of consumption and production, are because it is the best way to find and be part of thoughtful, topical, and radical conversations. Imagine telling literally anyone in the year 2000 that there would be a video hosting site where people make a living not just giving quirky, skit-laden rants about popular thing, but in-depth analysis of the global economic conditions. Imagine telling someone that in even early YouTube days. You'd sound more out of touch than early lunar adopters, except for the whole part about being wrong. But remember, just as quality is measured by quantity here, viability is measured by someone, or something that doesn't even watch the videos. James Stephanie Sterling of the Jimquisition has, I, I promise I'm going somewhere with this, 
in the past raised the point that game players are not consumers so much as cattle when it comes to how very large publishers work their business models. The customers are shareholders who are in turn catered to with large presentations not showcasing new and exciting games but revenue streams and monetization models. That's why, despite being remarkably unpopular, something very few people really wanted in the games they played, NFTs sort of manifested in a manufactured consent kind of way and were just offered as inevitable exciting upcoming features with the guys that players had demanded them. It was a new revenue stream and indeed had been demanded by customers, but those customers weren't the players. And so onto YouTube and platforms like it. Advertisers are the customers buying ad space. Creators aren't creating content as far as YouTube cares, they're creating ad space. Content consumers, in turn, are less customers to be appealed to as they are the responsibility of a creator to cultivate. I am but a free-range cow growing its own grass. There's not even an effective illusion of hierarchy here. And mind you, YouTube doesn't pay creators, technically. Let's compare this model to two typical service style jobs in the US. A cafe job works like this. A worker puts together X drinks an hour, each worth some small cost in materials, and sells them. Profit for the business comes from the difference between the income, represented by how much the drink sells for, and expense in the form of materials and labor costs. Basic stuff. A bartender is the same thing, except we have to change the model for expense. There's no labor cost. In a sense, because the bartender earns from the goodwill of patrons through tips alone, as a worker, they are, from a twisted perspective, renting the bar and its stock from the owner in order to put on a show of work. The cost of doing their work is simply everything they made from drinks. They may not bring their own tools. YouTube is somewhere between this. It both seeks the charity of patrons and gives a cut of the ads. We effectively rent the platform by paying half our earnings. In that way, pay is based on performance without pretending to be a commission model. You're paid what you earn in that you are not paid if you earn them nothing. But at least you owe no rent for the space. Now imagine if a bartender's boss, instead of just scheduling for good or bad shifts, had a lever they could pull to invite people to the bar and more or less invent a good slash busy night whenever. Now imagine the bartender never knows when it's gonna happen, if ever, and granted, no promises are made, but there's always the idea. Instead of the normal system of taking a slow Tuesday to earn a good Friday, we are constantly working Sunday, with no idea if the crowd is coming. And it doesn't seem to be based on quality of work, expediency, contentedness of guests, just quantity of drinks drunk. But there's hints everywhere that maybe the lever gets pulled based on what outfit the bartender wears and what drinks they've got listed on their sandwich board outside. More than anything, there's a pervading mood that the boss might hate your music taste and just hasn't told you yet, even though you still use the default bar playlist and radio safe edits. That's YouTube. To anyone who's spent more than one angry headline pondering what censorship truly is in the corporate age, it is no surprise that the dictates of content are not the First Amendment or cancel culture or anything Beanie Boy would decry, they're corporations. I almost want to go on a whole tangent about the massive sides of the human experience that are left out of discussion on platforms because of this angle, but I don't want to risk demonetizing this video that's already approaching an untenable length. For just a singular example, look at what creators like Evie Lupin have to go through to talk about their content, the hoops being jumped through, and the eternal feeling of being unsafe from it all suddenly vanishing. Of getting hit by the band bat that's so inconsistent and malleable it might as well be a pool noodle. Much, very much has been said on this topic before. It exemplifies the negative current, an impact of monetization culture just as much as bait content, just as much as mimetic language. The key takeaway from a space like YouTube is that its monetization, the way it has the potential to be a job, has shifted the incentives for making content. To corporate YouTube, the idea would be that nobody even looks at or thinks about their analytics, just just create some things, make stuff, fill the space. That's their idea. We shouldn't ever think of the fact the algorithm is there, just let it do its magic. Instead, they've created a space where entire channels find success in trying to talk people through navigating the algorithm. There's a paradox to those channels too, which I only note here because I love a good paradox. Say my channel is expressly dedicated to teaching people about the algorithm. Subscribe for more hot tips like these. Okay, now the audience is going to be YouTube hopefuls. But how does one get that ball rolling? 
Who would listen to some guy claiming to have cracked the code on the algorithm who himself only has like 300 subscribers, you know? They don't make content that looks remotely similar to what any aspirants come to them for. They aren't like you or any of the hopefuls. Using themselves as an example of what to do is absurd because their audience is remarkably desperate by design. I don't say this to knock them, but to simply call attention to the way authority for these claims works. I watched a few hours of content from these kinds of channels to shore up my thoughts for this section and it wasn't very worth it, at least for the sake of this video's content. In terms of the advice they had, I learned what I have always known, which is that YouTube is unsuited for rapid pivots, as I appear to do on my channel, and that YouTube deeply prioritizes growing within niches over reaching into many niches. Which makes sense. The reason larger channels, even in left tube land, can do pivots is because, with their personality in effect becoming their own niche, they are, effectively, too big to fail. By every tip and bit of advice they give, H Bomber Guy should be an abject failure channel, and yet he's managed to crack the code in an entirely different direction. It's the kind of thing they, in salvaging authority, would incredulously laugh off as, it shouldn't work, but it does, like a poker player who failed to call a bluff. Regarding the content of the gurus, the advice is usually genuine, sometimes sound, and always more subjective than they can admit. One added feature of it all is that they often want to play up how much YouTube is constantly evolving so that they can remake old guides. It's a business. They're a monetized channel that makes its money in ways that I can seldom call outright predatory, despite its intrinsically desperate audience. Some of these channels are also the only place I've seen discussions of what I can only call content creator self-care. Things like reminders of one's own worth, that this is a job, and that it's not a reflection of self-worth, that YouTube hasn't exactly done you any favors. It's almost radical to see that in spaces so dedicated to grind. My point is that there's a perhaps unexpected kindness in these guide spaces sometimes. It's not raw grift. But that gets washed out by where the brunt of content positions itself. The odd but entirely predictable prevalence of videos claiming to be a guide to the exact minimum requirements for monetization paints its own picture. This stuff is exclusively a product of the monetization culture. Without the culture, yes, people would still desire to be viewed, but I think folk practice would outstrip guides. This stuff is pure business. It's mysticism. It's content that would be entirely meaningless without other YouTubers and self-imagined soon-to-be YouTubers to consume it. It's bait and confidence, but that's business. Looking back at it all, I want to say, oh, brave new world, to this whole monetized platform thing, this world of creativity being a job, but the truth is, our expression has always been for sale. The monetization of content has always kind of been there, but in a more implicit and insidious way. Don't worry, this isn't about to pivot to some lecture about the patronage of early modern painters or something. Also, before this point, I've contained the conversation to sites focused on, well, creators, figures intended to be the key content generators. But I want to expand our perception of what content is and, in turn, who does content generation. We're sticking to the internet and going back to 1994. Note that there is a lot going on in this essay to come, and I won't unpack even most of it. I look to it here, for our purposes, as a cultural artifact, one that illuminates how innate these issues are to the internet. It is fashionable to suggest that cyberspace is some kind of island of the blessed, where people are free to indulge and express their individuality. Some people write about cyberspace as though it were a 60s utopia. In reality, this is not true. Major online services like CompuServe and America Online regularly guide and censor discourse. Even some allegedly freewheeling, albeit politically correct, boards like the Well Censor Discourse. The difference is only a matter of the method and degree. I have seen many people spill their guts online, and I did so myself until, at last, I began to see that I had commodified myself. Commodification means that you turn something into a product, which has a money value. In the 19th century, commodities were made in factories. 
which Karl Marx called the means of production. Capitalists were people who owned the means of production, and the commodities were made by workers, who were mostly exploited. I created my interior thoughts as a means of production for the corporation that owned the board I was posting to, and that commodity was being sold to other commodity consumer entities as entertainment. That means I sold my soul like a tennis shoe, and I derived no profit from the sale of my soul. Proponents of so-called cyber communities rarely emphasize the economic business mind nature of the community. Many cyber communities are businesses that rely upon the commodification of human interaction. They market their businesses by appeal to hysterical identification and fetishism, no more or less than the corporations that brought us the $200 athletic shoe. People can talk about cyberspace as a utopian community only because it is literature, and therefore subject to editorial revision. Prior events, plus another where a woman's death was choreographed as spectacle online, made me think about what electronic community was, and how it probably really did not exist, except, like I said, as a kind of market for the consumption of sign value. The full essay is linked below. It's interesting and briefly touches on many things that are outside the scope of our discussion. I do not intend to do a disservice to the questions it has for diversity, feminism, greenwashing, any of that by not including them. I recommend it in future, and may even cite it again someday. I won't spiral all of this into talking about the failed liberatory promise of techno-futurism and the internet, but I can't help feeling like, with the communal internet, we are looking at a revolution betrayed. Perhaps that too is for another day. From Pandora's Vox, we see that questions of commodity, of production, have been here longer than, I would wager, half of today's prolific internet users have even been alive. In a sense, crypto is an attempted modern solution to this now age-old problem. It is a solution that required the intensification of the problem in the process of solving it. Crypto looked at how this manufacture of content for the owners of the internet in 1994 could be solved by simply placing the power of monetization in the hands of creators, of manufacturers. With that vision set, their eyes widened at the potential of making every single facet of digital existence an earning opportunity, of effectively seeing all things as production without ever speaking in terms of labor. They have blurred the meaning of being paid for one's time, imagining the entirety of digital existence as transactional, which is in some sense like viewing every meal in one's life by a dollar to calorie ratio. It's practical to a point of misery, mathematical to the point of inhumanity. The execution of that ideal was far from successful, and in turn more or less created monetary schemes we've always had. Most of digital monetization as a practice from 1994 to now has used some manner of democratization or empowerment as its rallying cry, giving you, the creators, a slice of the pie, finally. But from medium's deployable walls to crypto's feudal structures to YouTube's king-making ghost in the machine, we've gotten nowhere fast. Tangential to this, there's also a means of monetizing our interaction not as creative energy, but as malicious little monsters. To that, there's a video by SK the Crusader that goes into the main character phenomena which has been with us since Humdog's time. Ultimately, this is not a perfect and totalizing view of the past, but it is a prescient relic. In it, we see a disdain for imagined utopia, a critique. Contempt, thus, for the evangelizing utopians who denied monetization was a danger. It hearkens to the crypto space near two decades early, but it also reminds me of someone and somewhere else. Okay, okay, no, I can't find a way to pretend RuneScape is a platform, even if it does have one hell of a shitposting community. We're returning to the present day with Twitter, a place I never expected would become part of my job. Twitter is a bit of an odd addition to this mix because it's inherently opposed to monetization, and not just in a how-do-we-even-do-it kind of way like Vine was. I... I can't believe I'm saying this, but maybe more sites need to be like Twitter, or like it was. I won't go too deep into the evolving story of Twitter's descent, both in that it's ongoing and in that it's covered ground, but here's the shortest bit for the blissfully logged out. In a fundamental misunderstanding of how verification is even given its value, Musk opted to turn it into a mix of paid status symbol, a membership system, and a soft inverse paywall. 
There are supposed to be algorithmic benefits to having the verification, though nothing has materialized as of yet. If we know anything from exploring YouTube, it's that preferential algorithm treatment is a dream for many. Following a slew of impersonation gags that cost advertisers collective billions in market cap value of their stock and delighted the entire internet all for $8, there are now allegedly plans to make company and government specific verification. The whole thing has been like watching someone walk backwards in a spiral. Inexplicably, we have ended up with Musk being a hands-on moderator like this is some dingy D&D &D forum in 1994 or a contemporary crypto scam. There has, for weeks now, been talk about abandoning the platform, but there's an important part of that which hasn't exactly been hashed out. The reason where do we go now is an unanswerable question is because all the options, frankly, suck. Those of us on Twitter know we are on an imperfect platform, and all the other ones are no better. People talking about Hive bring up that it's owned by an ableist and a Trump supporter, as though that isn't the case with four-fifths of the venture capital-funded tech landscape. Like, seriously, good luck finding a site that isn't owned by an ethically compromised billionaire. My personal solution is that we all just colonize academia.edu and set up accounts, shitposting in faux essay or critical response format. Sir. I have reviewed your recent post with regards to the claim that Stalin would have been an e-boy with intense frustration. It is clear to me you lack either the seriousness or the vigor to make it in this discipline. Clearly Bukharin was the one with e-boy energy. Now, realistically, Twitter is no stranger to jokes and hyperbole about leaving the hell site forever, but I want to, for a moment, take a quick stock of what stands to be lost with Twitter because I think it's dawning on people that this sucks for a reason. Twitter has been very helpful and effective for activists and outreach programs. Much has been said about the efficacy of organization and dissemination of information during the Floyd protests. For an even older example, think of the role social media took in the Arab Spring. You may likely know more about the presence Twitter had in that historical moment than the current state of a single country for whom it was historical. But those things are practical. They're important, but not the focus of this discussion. I won't go into every detail of Twitter's culture, as shitposting is more universal than the site, but I will explain what features I think make it both a useful tool, a place of communities, and in some ways resistant to advertisers and, until now, cataclysmic levels of monetization. Twitter's features allow for relatively easy circulation of content, but also curation of one's own feed. Where places like TikTok just blast you with the next thing in a row and it can be Russian roulette for transphobia, Twitter is more about following people than implicit ideas. There is an algorithm, to be sure, but ad spaces are noted when they're present, and other than the occasional slot dedicated to outright promotion or based on your likes content, most of the momentum behind discovery is social networking. Corporations know this, which is why there's the existence of brand Twitter and brands trying to go viral. Likes and retweets come from individuals, and while you can't exactly predict the extent of what a mutual might like, which could mean getting smacked in the face with erotic Zootopia art, for the most part it's a curated experience. The other end of this curation is that muting and blocking accounts is easy and effective. You can block advertisers, no questions asked. It's so mundane a significant feature I'm going to repeat it for emphasis. You can block advertisers. That may sound like it would cost Twitter a lot of potential clients, but think of it as the obverse of self-selection. Advertisers want their products shown to people who are interested, and if people who expressly aren't block them, that's not a wasted impression. Some people like to brag about how deranged their ads get because of their expert curation. Ads themselves are not rampant, which makes me wonder if Musk's claim that Twitter Blue will give you half the ads is either true and meaningless, or they're going to also crank the ad dial, if there's anyone left who wants to advertise. Either way, it is very funny to see a paid premium service that doesn't even offer an ad-free experience. And again, we've had the means to block ads we didn't like, which could be cathartic. Ads aren't the nuisance of Twitter. Bots are, but bots are blocked just as easy and only really swarm to viral posts or ones that mention keywords. I took a video of finding an ad, blocking it, and then scrolling until I found another one and gave up after 2.5 minutes because I was tired of speed scrolling. 
Note that this isn't emptier than pre-Musk. The only difference is that half the ads now are some Saudi image laundering program. Interesting to note here is that Musk's paid verification system conflicts directly with this block whoever system. With this system of negative curation, the incentive to actually be boosted isn't all that strong when you anticipate selective blocks. Verified status won't evade blocking. And in turn, as intimated when I said this became a new badge of shame to wear, people have already figured out that best practice will be to auto-block anyone that has paid verification, at once getting rid of the clowns willing to shell out, and nullifying the signal boost they paid for. This altogether is the impact of monetization, even in the negative, in resistance. Twitter is resistant to monetization because it gives the users some tools of curation. Even without those tools, Twitter doesn't have the same capacity towards monetization as something like YouTube. Musk bizarrely said in one tweet that he planned to turn Twitter into a YouTube competitor, saying it would be partly financed by the verified. This would ostensibly adopt a somehow worse form of what Medium does with its content with a vastly more significant data footprint. He wanted to offer room for posting 40 minute videos at 1080p. That could be anywhere from 300 MB to 3 gigs in upload. On top of that, Twitter does not have what I would call a navigable system. Tweets are meant to be flung into the ether and then forgotten about, not something as laboriously crafted and shelf stable as a YouTube video. Let's step aside for a second. A few months ago, Patreon lost a lot of money and had to fire a lot of people over a failed attempt to break into TikTok. What Patreon did was throw a lot of money at a few big TikTokers and some money towards mid-sized ones in an effort to promote Patreon, to get the TikTokers to try it out and tell everyone to pay them. This misstep was colossal. For reasons other than this, I was already convinced that Patreon didn't understand its platform, but illustrated for our purposes is how they failed to understand TikTok. They assumed that creation was the same on there as it would be on YouTube, that fandoms, followings, support was the same. They mistakenly assumed that just because a TikToker had 1 million subs and millions of views, it would be the same as hooking YouTube audiences. They failed to consider the relative value people put onto short-form content in a slurry. Supporting creators from places like YouTube off-platform leads to the creation of things meant to endure, works tangible things, not necessarily to be viewed as funded projects, but at least as something with presence. There are people who make longer form content than shorts, for whom Patreon would also be a bad fit, on YouTube no less. They also tried to get Mr. Peace to join Patreon, which is an even worse idea and I can't afford to tangent into that. The point is, they saw that some YouTubers use Patreon, and without thinking through the specific details of who, why, and how, they tried to slap that idea onto another video platform. Similarly, Musk failed to consider just how many people would be willing to pay for Twitter. Sycophants came out of the woodwork to be like, it's just $8, usually ending it with the new calling card of the least funny people on Earth, the tilted cry laugh emoji. All that to say, Twitter is not in the hands of someone who understands Twitter. Musk is redesigning the app around his own experience with having an abnormally high bot following and presuming that's a shared experience for all users. He's presuming his experience as the world's richest man is normal. He's listening to a cadre of dorks and somehow created a publicly observable echo chamber. Twitter is ostensibly in the hands of those assuring the emperor his clothes look lovely. This leads us to the situation we were always in. Twitter, our space, is out of our hands. I have likely done an imperfect job distinguishing creativity and production. To that end, I will restate and emphasize. Creation is jeopardized when it becomes production on the behalf of an entity like these platforms. However, on these platforms, we cannot avoid our creations becoming productions, even when we are, ourselves, unrewarded. Digital spaces are not a commons, not freely owned by us all, though we are what comprises them. Without people, there is no platform. That leads us to a separate and perhaps more subliminal theme, the way these sites rely on users as content creators. Simply that. In part, though not formally a response to Line Goes Up, it did inspire this work, in a perhaps unexpected way. The obvious route would be that I had the Lunar Story, but really it wasn't the I too know about crypto nonsense as much as it was that it forced me to remember those spaces, their culture, and in doing so, I reconciled the uncomfortable overlap with my YouTube experience, with discussions of individualist communities, aspirations, making it. I remembered that while crypto is a creatively bankrupt space, conversations in small YouTube were nearly as stark. 
What Lunar did in having its only remotely academic articles end up being about crypto projects feels like what Medium is doing with its articles on being good at Medium, what part of YouTube does with its gurus. There's a value to understanding how cultures shift with monetization, and how incentives are formed, and how those incentives shape what gets produced. But the biggest unifier here is that we don't congregate on these sites because they, the site, provide us with content. We congregate to witness and experience other people. Despite these dual revelations, that of the filters and walls monetization creates, and of platform versus people, we are not granted some easy, actionable control. We are, thus, bound on both ends, unable to control our own output, even as nominally free agents, and unable to reorganize. Efforts such as F the Algorithm, as I mentioned, attempt to change this. Supporting others attempts to change this. But working within these systems, there will always be that specter of monetization, wielding the algorithm like a scythe. This is not my moment to call for revolution so that I may make art freely without having to earn my keep. No, even now, in the throes of some form of passion, I have the clarity to see that as hyperbolic. It is more a reminder that we are creating communities in spaces we cannot own, cannot control, cannot take ownership of. What does the Twitter purchase prove if not that? There is no promised land we might flee to next. To end this on a note about the digital commons would appear to get away from my point, but in truth these things are interlinked. As I said, as Humdog expressed for us, these problems have been with us far longer than even the titans of the modern internet in Google and Facebook. We saw the flood wash over the dreams of the early tech utopians, and we could not build upon that land, for laying foundation deep into mud, jagged with rubble, required power we could not have, could not organize. It is not the fault or failing of anyone on the internet today that this is how it is. Companies laid new foundations and we moved on to the land they owned. The commons was never an option, the root issue bigger than the whole of the internet. Originally I intended to just cut this video off, full stop. I wanted to end on a note of dramatic impact, but I don't think it matters that much. People click off when they do, and being overly wrought in drama in the last 10 seconds isn't what makes a video do well. I'm very, very brain poisoned right now about algorithms and success, and caught in that mixed web of like, wanting things to do well, naturally, and worrying I'm losing sight of the distinction between reaching people and reaching numbers. As I said at the start, this video has, or will have depending on schedule, a companion video that's fully anecdotal and just exploring the last year. It'll probably also be melodramatic or sappy. Speaking of sappy, thanks. Like, real sincere thanks to everyone who contributes to the production of these things, be it voice talent with Little Hoot and Armchair Egyptology, script reads, letting me use the lizard breakdown, or patrons. That's not to say or imply prior thanks were insincere, but I guess making this one has made me hyper aware of support. Voice credits thanks this time goes to Chandler Mason, Etienne Garant, Freddy, Hausam, Nick, and Knight Swigron. There's a few new names here, and sorry if you came for Map Game and got smacked with this. There will be Map Game again soon, after the video in early January where I'm remaking my first one. That one doesn't really have a negotiable schedule spot if it's an anniversary. But there I go, breaking my rule on promising things. Uh, bye.